Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. In fact, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. The series is entitled Growing in Christ, and it's a discussion of some of our most basic Christian beliefs. This is number seven in that series for November 17 of 2012, and I would like to begin and ask you to join us in with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow now asking your guidance, your direction, and your help in our discussion. May we constantly remember that you are present with us. May we think about the weapons that we will be discussing, the weapons of your Holy Spirit, and may we learn better how to use them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a passage in Scripture. There are more, there's actually more than one passage, but one main passage in Scripture that discusses the Christian life's weapons. And that passage is found in Ephesians 6. And I, if you've got your Bibles, I certainly hope you do, open them for a moment to Ephesians 6. And I'm actually going to start with verse 10. Let's just read through the passage quickly so we get the picture. Finally, and I'm reading from the Good News Bible, the American Bible Society translation. Finally, build up your strength in union with the Lord and by means of his mighty power. Put on all the armor that God gives you so that you will be able to stand up against the devil's evil tricks. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So put on God's armor now. Then when the evil day comes, you'll be able to resist the enemy's attacks. And after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. That ought to be a worthy goal for a group of soldiers, shouldn't it? So stand ready with the truth as a belt tight round your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes a readiness to announce the good news of peace. At all times, carry faith as a shield, but with it you will be able, for with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one. And accept salvation as a helmet, and the word of God as a sword which the Spirit gives you. Do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray always for all God's people. So that's our passage for this week. Do you think of yourself as carrying around weapons in your day-by-day -day activities? I don't, but maybe we should. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of do, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like we, you know, should strongly in our mind. For a generation that went through um, some prior wars and uh, we were encouraged to be non-combatants, mm -hmm. this is a little strange to be talking about weapons in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, what other weapons? Let's just review them again and think about it for a moment. Paul, a as he's in prison here, writing the book of Ephesus, he's probably either chained to a piece of furniture or to the wall, or very likely chained to a Roman soldier who's wearing these things. He's looking at it right there. He says, well, let me think. How would the Christian fight compare to what these Roman soldiers do when they're out on duty? And he discusses the following pieces of military equipment. A belt, which is the girdle of truth. Um, we think of girdle as something else, but it was something they wore tied around their waist. And in those days, when they wore more or less flowing gowns, if they were in a hurry, they would bring those gowns up and tuck them into this belt. So the girding up your loins, which is a term they used, was, a, was sort of an um, idiom for getting ready to go and be, being ready for action. Then he talks about the breastplate, which he calls righteousness, the helmet of salvation, which is a gift from God, the shoes covering our feet, which are the gospel of peace, and finally, I'm sorry, the shield of faith, our key defense, and the sword, our offensive weapon, which is the word of God, 
or the Bible. Well, how can spiritual qualities be described as weapons? Doesn't that seem like a strange simile? Well, it's kind of, I mean, when you look at real weapons, you, you can see how they work. Mm -hmm. You know, a breastplate will, you can't get an arrow through it or you can't get a spear through it very easy and mm -hmm. all this stuff. But um, when you start mixing these, these metaphors with that, Mm -hmm. You don't quite see how that works, all except that it, it works. Mm -hmm. Well, so the question we would want to ask ourselves today is what do these weapons really mean? What kind of battles, now here's the big question, what kind of battles are actually taking place in the Great Controversy? It is obvious that mil the military equipment that the Roman army used would have no effect whatsoever in the Great Controversy or even in modern warfare. I mean, it would do nothing. It would be a waste. This is a battle of our, our brains, our minds, our thoughts. So how does a sword, a breastplate, a shield, a belt? Those is, is, are the things that we visualize in human warfare. Mm -hmm. But in, in Christian warfare, it says here, the belt is the girdle of truth. That's yeah. the, the thing that kind of holds us together. <laughs> So what weapons do work in the Great Controversy? I guess that's the first question we really need to, to ask ourselves. Truth. Truth. That would be Very good. One. And the belt surrounds us. Mm -hmm. It girdles us, keeps us in, inside the truth. Mm -hmm. that's, a okay. great, that's a great uh, weapon against unrighteousness. Well, Paul is clearly suggesting that we need to be personally and individually prepared and armed if we're going to face the devil. I mean, at least he, we, I think we would all agree that, that that's implied. Uh, as we've suggested on numerous occasions, Satan's kingdom is based on selfishness. While God can only use truth and love, now think about this warfare. God can use what? Truth and love. What does Satan use? Lies. Deceit, lies, misrepresentations, force, and we could go on and on. Mis there are so many things. The devil use anything he thinks he can. And of course, he loves to mix a little truth, maybe a little love, in with his deceit, lies, misrepresentations, so it, so it sounds better. Or maybe even a lot of truth with a little bit of lie. Yeah. That makes it even harder to determine that it's a lie. Yeah. Well, if it was all lies, nobody would believe it. Yeah. Well, and that's the point, exactly. Well, if you've ever had to, or ever been responsible for a, for a newborn baby, what did you learn? What was that? If you've ever been responsible for a newborn baby, what did you learn? Well, they made, <laughs> they're selfish, they look selfish, but they're not. They just want, it's their way of surviving. Mm -hmm. They okay. cry when they want something, they smile when they're happy, and they're very needy because they need us. They're totally focused on their own needs. Of course. Well, I mean, we're not blaming them for that. But what does that suggest? What kind of an attitude is that? Immature. Immature. It's selfish, selfish. attitude. Well, self-centered. I mean, they're only concerned about yeah. themselves and not, not anybody else's well-being and yeah. nothing figures into the equation. No baby I says, Mom, I don't want to bother you in the middle of the night. Just go ahead and relax. I'll, yeah. I'll wait. So if the human race hadn't have fallen, we would have had babies that were not selfish? What would they be like? Well, that's a fair question. Um, <laughs> it's a Maybe fair question. Have night from the first day. Yeah, they yeah. might not have been so helpless. Like, yeah. I don't want to wake up it's and wake like up mother. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's going to But happen. I'm glad they're selfish, <laughs> because even with, otherwise some people wouldn't take care of them at all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, whether we have been Christians all our lives or have only recently become Christians, we were born as sinners, fully on the devil's side in this war, we who live on this earth. If the devil sees us making attempts to leave his side and join God's side, he renews and increases his efforts to discourage us, to deceive us, to prevent us from leaving. But no matter what he is able to do, we know that he can never defeat Jesus. Why is that? 
The victory's already been won. The victory's already been won. The outcome, the final result has already decided, isn't it? Final outcome is already decided. But no matter what, he, um, he may make our lives somewhat miserable, but he cannot destroy us. So this isn't a case of destroying us physically, at least not at this point in history. Maybe in the future the devil will try to destroy Christians, but right now he's leaving most of us relatively well off physically. Okay? He's not trying to destroy us physically? Well, let's, I mean, he let's say he strikes up some wars and gets us to do his dirty work for him. Yeah. And he's kind of doing that, isn't he? Yeah. Except for some cancer and some infections right. and mm -hmm. motor vehicle accidents mm -hmm. and a few things like that. So what is our protection against the devil? These weapons, apparently, Paul fought, didn't he? No wonder it's so important that we understand the different pieces of armor, our weapons, and, and how to use them. As, you read, as we read through this passage in Ephesians 6, it's pretty obvious why Paul chose those particular pieces of military equipment to represent the Christian virtues. They were there. He could see them. There they were in front of him. Do we really need those weapons? Which weapons are you talking about? The ones in Ephesians 6. Sword, shield, breastplate, leather girdle, helmet. The ones he sees? Mm -hmm. Not the literal ones, but the figurative ones. Figurative ones, okay. Well, I mean, if, if, you, if we're trying to join a kingdom that's going to be based on love, why should we try to join it by fighting? Doesn't that seem contradictory? These are very yeah. deep, deep questions because there are, <laughs> there are answers to them, but sometimes by getting <laughs> into it, it, there may not be enough time. Well, is, there's definitely a fight there, and somebody needs to win. Okay. Okay. So, but the great controversy has already been won. Nah, it's not over with yet. Well, it's not over with yet. The great yeah. controversy is won, but is our salvation won? Well, that's still, to me, to me, that's Individual. still part of the great controversy. Well, it's interesting that the words used here to talking about fighting suggest hand-to-hand -hand combat. And you could imagine that Paul, looking at the soldier that's, you know, chained to him <laughs> there, he's thinking, he's not thinking about somebody pushing a button on a computer and firing a rocket a thousand miles away or some funny thing like that. He's thinking about someone fighting hand-to-hand -hand battles, isn't he? Like wrestling with an angel? Well, or wrestling. Yeah, yeah. We don't seem to take it as seriously, many folks today, this spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. Many people just kind of pray and, you know, but it's actually a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. Is the spiritual battle, battle more on our own behalf? Are we trying to fight for something for our benefit? Or is the spiritual battle also in the process of trying to represent Christ to others or both or? Maybe both. Okay. Certainly we have a duty to other people, mm -hmm. whether they're our friends, family, or our enemies, uh, but also for our, for mm -hmm. ourself. Now, we have used in the past, the scripture has used in the past, some long Latin words to talk about the Christian process of salvation and so forth. Things like justification and sanctification and you know, glorification and all of salvation. Lots of long words. Modern words equivalent to what the original Greek meant might be something like set right, put right, kept right. And Ellen White uses those words in some places. So how does the armor that we've been talking about relate to being put right, set right, kept right? Well, the first part of Ephesians talks about um, to resist the enemy's attacks. Mm -hmm. OK. You, I suppose you could take that either personally or globally. You know, okay. being the selfish person that I am, I'm going to think of it personally okay. and think, you know, 
the devil is going to work on me to convince me that the truth is not really the truth, that it's mm -hmm. wrong, just as Eve was deceived. So I, I have to put myself in Eve's position and think, you know, did she have her armor on when she mm -hmm. confronted the serpent? Okay, fair enough. And we have a parable from Jesus himself that talks about what's going to happen just before Jesus comes. Let's have a look at that in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and I'm going to start with the first verse. At that time, the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about what time? This comes immediately after Matthew 24, which is talking about what? The end times. The second coming of Christ, isn't it? Yes. So at that time, that would be hopefully in our day, right? At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there were ten young women who took their oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, what do we know about a, a Jewish wedding? In, in, in biblical times, just briefly. These ceremonies went on for Seven. often a week. And it was, if in a small village someone got married once a summer or something like this, it was the event, okay? So there was lots of preparation and there was lots of things on both sides and so forth. And eventually it would be time for the bridegroom to go to the bride's house and, and meet her there and so forth like this. And you, you couldn't tell for sure, you know. There wasn't a, okay, everybody will be at the church at four o'clock kind of a thing. It's whenever the bridegroom is ready. So there were 10 young women who took the oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and the other five were wise. Okay, does this have anything to do with weapons? Well, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any extra oil with them. Now the oil, has had different meanings in Christianity. Usually we take it to mean what? Holy Spirit. Yes, preparation, the, the, the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit, don't we? While the wise ones took containers full of oil for their lamps. The bridegroom was late in coming, so the women, women began to nod and fall asleep. How many of them were nodding and falling asleep? All 10. What good are weapons if you're sleeping? Not too useful, right? It was already midnight when the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come and meet him. The ten women woke up and trimmed their lamps. Then the foolish ones said to the wise ones, Let us have some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. No, indeed, the wise ones answered, There is not enough for you and for us. Go to the shop and buy some oil, uh, buy some for yourselves. So the foolish women went off to buy some oil, and of course in the middle of the night. And while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived. The five who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was closed. Later, the other women arrived. Sir, sir, let us in, they cried out. Certainly not, I don't know you, the bridegroom answered. And Jesus concluded, be on your guard then, because you do not know the day or the hour. Does that have something to do with being ready and having your weapons ready? Well, why did you say that? that when you're asleep, weapons don't do you any good because everybody falls asleep. Yes. Well, um, therefore, so it may not be as dangerous as you think it is. Well, but hold on. What was the difference between the ones who, who were sleeping but were wise and the ones who were sleeping but were not wise? They'd made preparation. They had made preparation. They, they had done their homework. They knew their Bibles. They were ready. So when they woke up, they were already ready. The problem with the other is what? They woke up and they said, oh, it's time to get ready. No, it's too late to get ready then. All of us are going to wake up one of these days, if we're still alive, and we're going to find out that we're either ready or we're not ready. And by then, it's too late to get ready. Now, why wouldn't, um, you know, we were talking about selfishness here. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the, um, the, the foolish one, the foolish ones couldn't get any oil from the unselfish other ones. Well, because they recognized that what they had was only enough for them. So that if they had all, if they had shared all their oil, the whole place would have gone dark halfway through the ceremony. 
You got to be careful how far you try to push a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could you could have said, well, they should have planned ahead, and they know, know they're going to have to share maybe with somebody. They take some extra. No, nah, this is a, a story to make yeah. a point. Yeah. yeah. We can flog this along. <laughs> and, I think, and I think pushing that metaphor down the road a little bit more. I think that the uh, all ten of them. I think I believe that the Bible described them as virgins. Mm -hmm thus representing some form of righteousness. Mm -hmm. All ten of them were invited to the mm -hmm. party, either through some friend or had they been in the group, had they stayed with the group. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of makes us think we do need to be ready. We need to stay with the group mm -hmm. spiritually and, and have our weapons, our armor, our helmet, our breastplate, our belt. This is a, a kind of a kind of a parable of looking for the second coming, right? Mm -hmm. For eternal life. Yeah. And I, I go back to John 17, 1 to 4. Mm -hmm. You know, reduce it down to something you can pack around. Eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. To know means to you spend some time in incorporating what you, uh, some learning from here. Yes. And yeah. beyond that, you really don't have much else. But uh, you, you can't just get it because you carry an empty bu uh, shell right. of a book around. Right. Because well, you grew up in a certain church. Sure. Because you so go to church every week. So okay. read the word. Isn't going to do it. Regarding the ten versions, that we were all called, but some of yes. us have answered and some of us do not do not answer. But uh, I cannot. It's not transferable. If I do my work, if I study yeah. the Bible, if I have a relationship with God, it's my relationship. Yeah. I can ev cannot even transfer it to my son. Regarding the oil and the landing, that's where I see it. Yeah, you're right. Right, very good. But the, the, largest, <coughs> the largest point of the parable is the delay, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's well, and the, the readiness. biggest point. The biggest the readiness, point is the delay right. and the readiness. Right. Now, we're talking about the readiness. Well, there's another place where Paul, in this case, and Paul is the one who speaks in Ephesians, so we, should, we shouldn't mind using him elsewhere. What else does he say about the end of time? Well, look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. And I'm reading again from my Good News Bible. Remember that there will be difficult times in the last days. People will be selfish. Do we see any of that today? Oh, Greedy, boastful, conceited. They will be insulting, disobedient <laughs> to their parents, ungrateful, and irreligious. They will be unkind, merciless, slanderous, violent, and fierce. They will hate the good. They will be treacherous, reckless, and swollen with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. Are we talking about our day or what? <laughs> they will hold to the outward form of our religion but reject its real power. Keep away from such people. Boy, Paul is pretty clear about <laughs> how he feels about them, isn't he? You know, it's interesting to notice in a number of places when Paul starts talking about sins, he has a hard time stopping. There's a list, <laughs> a long <laughs> list. Well. These passages, although dealing with quite different subjects, suggest that each of us is responsible for our own fate. We must get ourselves ready. God makes all the provisions for our salvation, but we must take advantage of them. And I would remind you that if you look at those things, we talk about salvation by faith, righteousness by faith, sanctification by faith, justification by faith. What's the common term in all of those? Faith. Faith. What is our part in all of those? Believe. Believe God. Okay, which is another word for? Faith. 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 The only thing we have to do is the faith. We don't do the justification. We don't do the sanctification. We don't do the salvation. We don't do the glorification. We, d we you don't do the righteousness. God does all those things. All we have to do is the faith. If we have the faith, then God will take care of the rest of it. Doesn't do that make it easy? you know if you have the faith or not? How do you know? Yeah. Well, we have some pretty good clues about what faith is. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God, as with a friend well known. It's in the Bible, it's translated some, the word is pistis in the Bible. It's sometimes translated faith, sometimes belief, sometimes confidence, and sometimes um, trust. Wonder, choice. Yeah. Trust. Trust, trust, I'm sorry, trust. But um, James does say that um, faith without works is dead. Yes. So I think so in other words, faith, faith is, works. Faith is more of a container that holds both faith and works. Faith is an action word. Yeah. 
And faith is an action word, right, but I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't make it synonymous with belief completely. Well, not in our modern terminology, yes. Yeah. In, in, the, in the original, in the biblical language, it was the same. And the works, the works kind of come out of the faith just because we yeah. believe. What we what, love. Well, that's, that's why I think that um, faith is a container with both beliefs and works. You do the works because of your belief. You do your, your um, well, belief the, the, because of your works. I mean, that's, that's how you get judged at the end. They're going to see what you've yeah. done, and then they're going to be able to be able to convict you of faith. Yeah. And that's, that's what, how you get judged. The book of James basically says one major message. It says, you can have faith, but if it doesn't change the way you behave, it's dead. So the, 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 any, the faith that's alive works. Faith works if it's alive. If it's valuable, if it's doing something, it makes a difference. And God's, that's why the Bible says we're saved by faith, but we're judged by our works. Because if the faith doesn't produce any actions, it's dead. Well, think of all the things that you have to do for yourself if you want to be benefited. Yes. Can I apologize for interrupting your flow? If, now we're not saved by works. No. So, but if we don't have any works, do we really have faith? No. So the, the works come like just flow from us. Okay, now we have to be careful how we say that because look at the thief on the cross. How many works did he do? Zero. But his work was that belief, that faith at that moment was his work. But he made it in an a expression way. of faith, yes. which was wor has valuable to it's taken it. some yes. down, down through the centuries, yeah. has had an impact down through the centuries. Yeah. So it's uh, just a sm few, few uh, phrases. As and I, I think we have put way too much emphasis on what works is Thanks. as something visual that, well, he's He's but working you need at his it, faith. though, to see whether you have faith or not. You need to, or you need to be able to see when somebody else has When you get judged faith. in the final, final thing, they're going to look at, at you or what else? you've done. Are you looking at somebody else or yourself? That was my question. What? For what? For that, that for evidence works. of works. Do I look for somebody else? At somebody else's works or at your well, own when works? Somebody, when somebody looks at your life, I mean, when you're being judged... Am I judged, worried about what you guys are looking at me, or am I worried about him looking at me? That's the difference. Well, when he went... Okay, but uh, I thought maybe the angels kind of needed to know whether we were... Um, well, they have, they have God standing beside them to help them, uh, give them a clue what to see, what to look at. That's right. But they're, they are looking at something. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're talking about weapons now, so let's try to get back to that. Now... One of the questions here is this. What, how many things can you think of that you have to do for yourself? You have to breathe for yourself. Now, you can have assistance to your breathing, but if you stop breathing, nobody else can... I mean, Yoli here can't breathe on my behalf. See, she just can't do it. Um, no, you, can, you have to eat for yourself. Now, someone can try to force it down you with the tube, but basically you have, your body has to digest that food or you know, it doesn't do any good. No one can sleep for you. You have to do it for you. can't say, would you sleep for me tonight? I, I'm busy. No, no one can see or hear or think or make choices for you ultimately, although some may try to make your decisions. You may do some of these things relatively passively, but by so doing, you are, in effect, choosing to let someone else help you with them. Are we all together on that? Because now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about how this might apply to the weapons. Yes? All of those things except choice, and maybe hearing and seeing, the babies do, the newborn babies do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, what is the girdle of truth? Now let's see if we can come to our weapons and let's try to put the pieces together. The expression, gird up your loins, is a Greek idiom sometimes used to say, get yourself ready. Paul may have been thinking about a leather apron worn below the breast plate, a little bit lower down, that provided some protection for the lower abdomen. 
had also allowed for relatively easy movement. Paul compared this basic piece of equipment with truth. Since the truth is not on Satan's side, it is a very important weapon in dealing with him. Satan may use bits of truth to seek to support his arguments. Do we have any examples of that in Scripture? Sure. Look at the example of Christ, I mean of Satan tempting Christ in Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, set him on the highest point in the temple, and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down, for the scripture says, What's Satan doing here? Quoting scripture. He's quoting scripture. Did he quote it accurately? Yes, but out of context. Well, not only out of context, he left out the part that didn't agree with what he wanted to say. He intentionally just left it out. So, but the de so the devil can use truth. But if we take the larger view, in other words, if we say, okay, I'm not just focused on this tiny little bit of truth that the devil's putting on my plate. I want to see the whole picture. How does this thing fit with the whole picture? Then what, do we have reasonable certainty that we're, we'll be okay? If we insist on the full truth, who's always going to lose? Satan. Satan. Well, in addition to the leather apron, Roman soldiers wore a breastplate. The breastplate consisted of two thin sheets of metal, shaped more or less to fit the body, covering the front of the chest, one covering the front of the chest and the other covering the back of the chest. Um, and I think we can all imagine how that would work. These breastplates covered many of the important internal organs of the body. Thus, the breastplates and the leather apron covered the essential internal organs of the Roman soldier. When we as Christians practice truth and righteousness, we are protected from most of the fiery darts of the devil. Truth and righteousness go together as suggested by many passages in Scripture. Uh, some examples, we won't take time to read them. 1 Kings 3, 6, Psalms 15, 2, 96, 13, Proverbs 12, 17, Isaiah 40, verse 1, and 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7, even Ephesians 5, verse 9, just a chapter before what we're studying right now. People who are determined to tell the truth most often do what is right. Justice and fairness go with truth. Injustice goes with lies. Practicing the truth will lead to righteousness. Does that begin to give us a, an idea of how these weapons are supposed to fit together to, to protect us? If we insist on the truth, is the devil going to have any chance on it, with us? I, uh, you know, we, we, let me just use an illustration to, to, to try to show how important this is. The story is told about a debating society in Ireland. And, you know, they, they would pick almost anything you can imagine, and a couple of people are, would be on one side, and a couple of people, and they would debate these things just back and forth. And one day, one of the members of the society said, look, he said, you know, truth has to be consistent with itself. If you give me any false statement, I can use the, the rules of debating to prove any other false statement. And someone else looked at him and said, ah, I don't believe that. He says, try me. He says, okay, four equals five. That's a false statement, right? Four equals five. We all agree that that's a false statement. Prove that I'm the Pope. And the guy looked at him for a moment. He says, okay. Math rules say that you could subtract equal amounts from both sides. So if a 4 equals 5, you subtract 3 from each side, and you have now 1 equals 2. Now everybody in the world knows that you and the Pope are 2, so you and the Pope are 1. So you see how if we allow falsehood into our paradigm, what happens? It can be dangerous. I don't know where the falsehood was on that. Four equals understand. five. <laughs> you don't know what that four well, equals false is. Four equals five is a false statement. There's two falsehoods: one that he's the pope, and four equals five. Well, that's what the man said. He said, "If if you give me any one wrong statement, I will prove any other wrong statement." He said both of these are wrong statements, but you can use the rules of logic. If you start out with a false statement, you can use the rules of logic to prove any other false statement. This is why we must make sure, as our Bible text says here that we have on the armor of what? Truth. 
We can't allow any falsehood into our paradigm or what happens? It loses validity. Yeah. But you have to start with the truth. If you, if you start from a point of mistruth, you're always going to have, you're never going to have things right. If you start from a point of real truth, you may continue with it. And, and the example is this. You, you, some people tell a lie, which is a mistruth, and then what happens pretty soon? They have to tell another lie to cover up that one, another lie to cover that one. We, we've all had that. We know about those experiences. Well, in the writings of Paul, there's considerable discussion about righteousness. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, All our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the righteousness which we need to put on is the righteousness of whom? Christ. Of Christ. How do we do that? We can only put on this kind of righteousness by daily practicing the truth and honesty as we study our Bibles, pray, and when given op an opportunity, witness for Christ. These are the ways in which can, we can become more like Him. Well, look at one of our verses, Ephesians 6.15. Now let's work our way through the passage. What does it say? And, on, and as your shoes, the readiness to announce the good news of peace. The readiness to announce the good news of peace. Roman soldiers wore shoes studded with sharp nails. Why do you suppose they did that? Kind of like spikes. Yeah. We would term spikes. And what's the advantage of that? Uh, better footing. In what kind of circumstances? Where perhaps the miry clay, if you will. Sure. If you're in the middle of rainy season in the Mediterranean where there's lots of rain and you have to get up a slippery hill, it's helpful to have spikes on the bottom of your shoes, I isn't it? I remember something about a miry clay perhaps in, yeah. uh, uh, where was that? Proverbs? No, Isaiah. Oh. Uh, let's see, my, yeah, there, the Bible talks about my clay, yeah. Well, this gives you the best possible footing under the circumstances. When you want to fight, what happens if you don't have a firm footing? You can fall down. And what, what, how good are you with your weapons if you're lying on the ground? Not, Not very good, right? So when the Roman soldier had put on the rest of his armor, and he had to put on his shoes, he was prepared for battle. It is difficult for a soldier to fight effectively when his feet are not solidly planted on the ground. Without a thorough knowledge of the gospel, the Christian soldier, soldier is not ready to go. By the way, talking about sure footing and sure, not just sure footing, but be, be solid and able to do something, there's a very interesting postulate that I think is probably valid. Why didn't when the Muslims were sweeping across North Africa and came up to Spain and Portugal and were crossing the Pyrenees, finally a man by the name of Charles, Charles Martel, I believe was his name, he was able to fight them back. What was the advantage that he had over the Muslims? Do you remember? Anybody you know this story? I, I had horses. It has a lot to do with horses. Armor for the horses. No. no. Saddles. The Europeans had invented stirrups for their saddles, so they had a more, they could they could st partially stand up in those stirrups and fight as they raced past each other, and the the Muslims didn't have stirrups for their saddles, and they were not as stable. And it's p very possible that it was stirrups that kept the the Muslims from sweeping through Europe. Solid footing makes a big difference. Well, look at Ephesians 6, verse 16. At all times carry faith as a shield. We've talked quite a bit about faith already. For with it you will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one. How does faith do that? You believe so you don't let uh, the flames and arrows of unrighteousness penetrate you because they don't mean anything. Okay. You, you believe... So it doesn't matter what someone throws at you. Hey, we, someone may say, we come from monkeys. We're descendants from apes, gorillas, chimpanzees. But if we have faith and we don't believe that, then, then that type of material doesn't affect us. If we trust God and we trust his word and we have plenty of reason for doing that, what, are these, what do these fiery darts shot at us, what do they do? 
They have no effect. We, we, you know, we don't pay attention to them. <coughs> well, the Roman, sho sho Roman soldiers carried a shield which measured approximately four feet high and about two and a half feet wide. That would be about like so. And this was made of two layers of wood glued together. Covering those layers of wood was, a th was thick leather. In ancient times, often the first attack the soldiers would face if they came up to, particularly to a walled city was from arrows covered with burning pitch. And those arrows were often shot from a distance. The leather covering on the shield was difficult to burn, so it helped to protect the leather. Sometimes the, the, the arrows would stick right into the shield, but the leather basically wouldn't burn, and so it would put the burning pitch out, assuming you could keep the shield between you and the, fire, and the fiery uh, arrows. So faith is a description of our relationship with God as with a friend. It is an absolutely essential part, perhaps the most essential part, of the protection the soldier used. Satan attacks us with fiery arrows, such as lust, doubt, greed, vanity, covetousness, and selfishness. It is only through a meaningful and personal relationship with God that we can deal with these things. So we go to our next piece of equipment here, Ephesians 6, 6 verse 17 and accept salvation as a helmet, and the word of God is a sword which the Spirit gives you. Salvation is a helmet. Okay. I notice we have a theme. We keep talking about the spiritual battle, and it's a battle that takes place in our brain, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's fitting that salvation is a helmet, mm -hmm. which would cover our brain, protect our brain. And it's interesting that this salvation is described as what? A gift. So the helmet is described as a gift of God, which is our salvation, isn't it? Do we do anything for our salvation? Do we have to buy it? Do we work for it? Have faith. Just our faith. Mm -hmm. And God gives it to us. Just like he gives us justification, sanctification, righteousness, salvation. All of those are gifts. We just, have, we just need to have that trusting relationship with him. I notice in verse 13 of Ephesians 6 that it says, so put on God's armor now. So it's not our armor to start with. It's, it's Very all a gift from him. Great yep. point. Well, Paul is probably using, using an illustration he got out of Isaiah 59, verse 17. But it's interesting that over there, the helmet being worn is being worn by God. Here in Ephesians 6 and also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Paul said God gives us a helmet, the helmet to wear. While other pieces of equipment are to be taken up and put on, the helmet is a gift. We must always remember that salvation is a gift. We must take it and put it on. Remember that the word for salvation in Greek also means healing. We cannot heal ourselves from the ravages of sin. Healing is a gift from God. In order to fight his best, the Roman soldier needed to be completely well so he could put up a good fight. I don't think any of us would argue with that. So finally, Paul, near the end of his offensive not offensive message, but his discussion of offensive and defensive weapons talks about the offensive weapons. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. How does the Word of God serve as a weapon? It's the source of earth. Do we have some illustrations in Scripture about how that works? There's a very interesting expression or verse in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that says, the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. How do you separate the desires and hearts and thoughts of the heart? Not easy, right? You've got to have a pretty sharp sword, right? Well, of course, Jesus used the Word of God repeatedly in his dealing with Satan, didn't he? Even when Peter was expressing, you know, finally Satan said, well, let me, let me see if I can get at Jesus by working through one of his disciples. And Peter made that wonderful statement, you are, you know, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And a moment later, what is he saying? 
He's saying, Jesus, none of that stuff, you know, Jesus was talking about, you know, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to, I'm going to die. No, 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 you can't let that happen to you. Peter would not permit it, he said. Yeah. I will not permit that. I will not allow that. And, and what did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. He uses, here's Satan trying to use not only the words of Scripture sometimes, but the disciples of Jesus to, to get at Jesus. We may, well, the Word of God is an essential part of Christians, so, the Christian's weaponry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. Some people may have missed that point. So, had Peter known more deeply the Word of God, mm -hmm. he would have known that the Christ, the Messiah, had to come and had to die mm -hmm. for our sins, mm -hmm. suffered for us, mm -hmm. and, and offered us the free salvation. So, I think that was the point. Yeah. But some, you know, it's kind of complex. He was looking for a general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. Yeah. Well, the Word of God is absolutely essential for Christians. It is the only offensive weapon that we have. We may be covered by all the appropriate armor, but if we have no offensive weapons, we're in trouble and we're not much used to God's army, are we? Not figuratively, anyway. Notice how Jesus used Scripture to deal with Satan's attacks. We've talked about that. The better we are in our study of the Bible and our understanding of the issues in the great controversy, which is an important point, who is it that's supposed to understand the issues in the great controversy? Well, Seventh-day Adventists have claimed that the great controversy is one of our main, in fact, we started out this series of lessons saying that's one of our main points, right? Everyone should have a, yeah. a good understanding of it, but many, many folks in different denominations really don't. And if we don't have a clear understanding of the great controversy, we aren't aware of Satan's methods, what are our, what are our chances against him? At least less, right? By, by understanding what the, the issues are in the great controversy, it's kind of like we can see the playbook what's happening so we can be careful and not be trapped mm -hmm. not go down the wrong roads yeah even though sometimes we go down the wrong roads anyways perhaps we can you know navigate a little bit better with the lord's help of course and we need to understand that this is not just some kind of a battle over us the, what are the issues in the great controversy it's over god's character and it's an it's an argument. It's a fight over God's character. And remember, right from the very beginning, God says, "If you sin, you will die." And what does Satan say? That's a, That's a lie, not true. So right up front, we see this disagreement. Not true. It's true. It's not true. So the issue in the great controversy really boils down to who is telling us the truth. That's what the great controversy is really all about. And the corollary would be, can God be trusted? Now, it almost seems sacrilegious to ask a question like that, but can God be trusted? Satan sure doesn't want us to think that, that he can be trusted. But God said absolutely we can be trusted. God makes some astounding statements. He said, sin is deadly. And I look at all of you sinners, and none of you are dead yet. So it almost seems like God has told us something that's not true. Now we know that given enough time, we all will die here on this earth. But is, God, is that what God is talking about? He's not talking about that first death, is he? He's talking about the second death, the eternal death, the death that results directly from sin. Do we really believe that sin is deadly? So if we really believe that, we're all going to stop sinning right away, right? And why are you all smiling at me? Because you're just a, you're supposed to smile on TV, <laughs> right? <laughs> as a sinner, as a sinner, yeah. and, and that disturbs some people when they hear that, but as a sinner, I, I need to be very careful how I speak. You know, I remember, the, I remember all the folks around the adulterous woman that wanted to stone her. So, you know, we're all guilty, but if we go to the Word, 
and we put on these uh, instruments that are the, belong to the Lord, as Gordon pointed out, then we can, you know, with the Lord's help, the Lord is modeling us, the Lord is perfecting us, and, and I believe at the, at the last day, in a twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. And I would add, not only perfecting us, but protecting us. Yes. That's exactly what the point of this lesson, isn't it? Well, we come now down to verse 18, Ephesians 6, verse 18. Do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray always for all God's people. So, Paul finishes his list by telling us to pray always. This suggests that we must keep alert, we must never give up, we must never allow Satan to catch us sleeping. Remember the ten virgins? And we must be thankful for the fact that God is always ready to hear our prayers. We are even urged to be persistent in our prayers. Well, in connection with our praying, we are urged to be watchful. And Mark 14, 38 says that, so does Mark 13, 33 to 37. It is through Bible study and prayer that we hold conversation with God. And I quote, this is from Ellen White, Christ Topic Lessons, page 129. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to Him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. Is that what your prayers are like? Sometimes. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws nigh to commune with us as he did with Enoch. When this is, is, when this is in the truth, the experience of the Christian, there is seen in his life a simplicity, a humility, meekness and lowliness of heart that show to all with whom he associates that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. Does that remind you of Matthew 5.16? What does it say in Matthew 5.16? They will look at you and they will see your behavior and they will glorify you. No. Who do they glorify? God, right? Well, it's good to pray for others. It is essential that we pray for ourselves. All day long, we need to talk in prayer about everything that affects us. God should be recognized as our constant companion. And every soul, I'm reading once again from Ellen White. This is uh, from the youth instructor of January 10, 1901. In every soul, two powers are struggling earnestly for the victory. Now, I shouldn't have to tell anybody now. Who are the two powers? Christ who are the leaders? Christ and Satan. Christ and Satan, sure. Unbelief marshals its forces, led by Satan, to cut us off from the source of our strength, which is God. God. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to cut us off. He's trying to separate us from the source of our strength. And what does the Bible say separates us from the source of our strength? Unbelief. Discipline. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Look at that for just a second. Look at uh, Isaiah. 59 and verse 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. Your sins separate you from God when you try to worship him. That's because sin is lawlessness, rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude. It's not an act. By contrast, faith marshals its forces led by Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Hour by hour, in the sight of the heavenly universe, the conflict goes forward. This is a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and the great question is, which shall obtain the mastery? This question each must decide for himself. So does God decide for you? Are we going to let Satan decide for us? Ultimately, either actively or by default, we have to make that decision on our own behalf. In this warfare, all must take a part fighting on one side or the other. From the conflict, there is no release. Ellen White, Youth Instructor, January 10, 1901, paragraph 4. If we are using these weapons of Christianity correctly, we can help our fellow Christians in the Christian way as well. 
We must never forget that we are in the middle of a deadly war. Hopefully, soldiers do not forget that they are in the middle of a war. God has given us great honor by asking us to be his foot soldiers. He, yes. it, sorry, if I may interrupt. Sure. And being in that war, we need to train ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and what I'm talking about is by reading the word and by prayer. But we need to train ourselves so that we're not spiritually weak, mm -hmm. as we can be from time to time especially if we're not in the Bible, especially if we're not praying. Yeah. It's, it is that sharp double-edged sword. God has provided us the means for us to be successful in this battle. I mean, we've said these weapons, this, this protection and the weapons all come from God. It is a battle for minds. Do we clearly understand the use of each of these two items in the battle we call the Great Controversy? Review what you know about Satan's attacks against the human race down through the ages. How did he deceive Eve in the Garden of Eden? How did he attempt Je tempt Jesus in the wilderness? What methods did he mainly focus on in the past? What methods does he seem to be focusing on in our day? Will he be using different methods in the near future as we approach the end of this earth's history? We do not offer suffer physical persecution at this point in history. But we know the day is coming when Satan will not hesitate to use every means he can to destroy us. Try to imagine Paul probably chained either to some piece of furniture or possibly even to a Roman soldier himself while he, is under the, while he was under house arrest in Rome. Did he admire the armor that the Roman soldiers wore? Did he discuss it with them? The armor the soldiers wore was not intended to be slept in. It would not have been comfortable at all. But that meant that each morning as a soldier arose from sleep, he had to put on his armor once again. Are we daily putting on the armor of God? Review the various pieces of military equipment that we have discussed. Are we making the best use of each of these items? Down through the centuries, Satan has proved that he is very effective with his lies, deceit, treachery, force, etc. God can only use truth and love. It's, does this seem like a lopsided battle? Well, when Jesus was here on this earth, he faced attacks from every side, as you can imagine. The devil was in full-time full -time attack mode. The Jewish nation, his own people, rejected him. His own family rejected him. Even his disciples doubted him and, and, and betrayed him. So what's the hardest part of this battle? How do we prepare ourselves for facing the final attacks of Satan? Do we understand these weapons in Ephesians 6? Do we know how to use them? I hope you do. I hope I do. See you next week.